Just to call that out. Yeah. <laughs> But it's a local user group from Waco, Texas. So <laughs> yeah. It would have been an interesting um, uh, if you showed up there. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So we will get the meeting going in just a second. I'm actually going to go ahead and um, while you're getting set up with Wi Fi and stuff, Bill, do you have any announcements or any final things for the year that you want to talk about for your group? Just, just that. Uh... We're planning a big meeting in January with uh, Tim Warner, who's a pretty well-known presenter. And awesome. if, you've, if you've got, you know, most of the group, most of the folks in the group know Tim. If you've got a suggestion for a topic, let, let us know. We'll, he's pretty flexible and we'll talk about anything that we ask him to talk about. So just let us know. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, so Bill, what I heard, because it's still coming through a little, a little low on our side, but it sounds like Meeting in January, you got a, a pretty well-known speaker that um, I didn't catch the name, but good topic, sounds like. Yeah, it's Tim Warner. Oh, Tim. Oh, okay, I got you, Tim Warner. Yeah, yeah. so y'all don't know Tim. Tim's great. He's presented plenty of time at like Music City Tech and other places around uh, Nashville. Um, I, any particular topic? No, in fact, I was asking the group if you have a suggestion for a topic, he can talk on a lot of different things. Awesome. awesome. So, yeah, so no, just, no, no. okay. So you're saying if anybody so if anybody wants to hit Bill up on topics on exercise. So for us, or Bill, you got anything else? Nope, that's it. Take it away. I'm gonna go awesome. out and mute because well, my sound is messed up. <laughs> okay. No, you're good, you're good. Well, as yeah. y'all know, this is a joint user group meeting tonight between Nash.net and Nash Azure. And so we always uh, love to do those because I feel like we're we're um, kind of almost like sister groups. We're very much in the same family of things, I would say. But um, I think a lot, and especially this topic tonight on API management, um, I think is really relevant across both both sides of the, the house for sure. Um, for the Nash.net side, so a couple things. One is uh, for January for us, it's always our career panel. I love the career panel, probably one of our uh, biggest events. We are getting speak we're getting panelists right now, um, but we should have uh, several good panelists. Usually we have a mix of people with different levels of experiences. Usually we get like a recruiter's perspective because I think there's a that's definitely a different perspective in the industry. Uh, we'll get some people that are in that kind of like hiring manager roles up to you know C-level, depending on what we can get. So we are still working on that right now, but that's always a, a great event for both like people that might be new in their career, but also for people that uh, are trying to grow in their career. So that's a that's a good event. So tell your tell your friends too, especially if they're like trying to get into tech. Um, the other things that I guess I'll talk about. So um, for us, I, I know I've talked about this the last couple of groups, but we're in like the heat of it. If y'all don't know, I'm going to share the screen really quick. Uh, hang on one tick. Uh, where is the screen share thing? It's the oh, it's the middle. Of the, sorry, I use Teams a lot. I gotta like flip my mind to Zoom. Yeah, you know, for just a brief. Ah, oh, all right, Bill, can you give me participants sharing? Maybe. Yeah, I will, Carl. Where, where, where are you? You're not on the list. Oh, uh, Francis. Francis. We're on okay. Francis's computer. Okay, I'm gonna make you the. Uh, Co-host, how's that? I'll make you the host. I'll give, it, I'll give it all to you. Give it all to you. Okay, so Francis should be able to share. Go. Oh, yes. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Looks like I've got it now. So I will share the screen for just a brief moment. Then we'll flip the share over as well to our speaker tonight. Um, but if you don't know, one of our and we were talking like gives back stuff earlier, like stuff that we do, like volunteer work and huff and stuff. But uh, so our group uh, volunteers to help out uh, every year, well, for the past three years, Carl. Um, helping NORAD track Santa. Carl, uh, all, I see, all I see is a black yeah. screen, Carl. Oh, you see the black screen? Black screen. Black screen, it's all right. right. It's Francis. It says Francis Harpole has started screen sharing, but it doesn't show anything. Gotcha. Well, I don't know why it's not sharing anything. For us, it shows a green line around it like we are sharing. Oh, there but, it is, it uh, came up, it for came everybody up. everybody else. It's good, it just came up. 
just came up. Okay, that's not the right side. I just clicked on something. But uh, so you can see right here, I'm actually gonna go. So we actually do the mobile app. We don't do this. This is actually something that uh, Microsoft puts together. But I think if we go here, we can scroll to the team and ooh, too far down, too far down. But look, we are right up one of the first ones. We do a lot of stuff with them. So we actually do uh, monthly meetings and, and what have you. We do their mobile app. So we help them put this together. This is stuff done by uh, people at Nashville. So if you are on the Play Store or Apple uh, Apple Store, you can go download the NORAD Track Santa app, games and stuff like that. Probably more targeted towards kids in your life, more than likely. Um, but uh, we do enjoy that. We actually just had probably our last meeting of the year on this. and. Um, uh, and they appreciate it. So it's fun for us. It's uh, if you ever want to get involved, uh, that would be something to get involved with in the group. As well. So um, I will try to finagle this mouse thing, stop the share, and then let's flip over and we'll get our uh, Yeah. So do you need to uh, we'll log in? in. Yeah. Um, so let me get you on. Let you in soon. Do, 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 do. So also, I'm thinking for the benefit of people on online, where where's the mic, or should I share? So them? the mic is these mics just hanging, so okay. you'll actually get picked up pretty much. However, um, okay. you're uh, so let's also make sure that you have share permissions. Sure, keep going. Um, all right. So for the Zoom uh, challenged, how do I? Probably security, I'm guessing. And let's. Uh, hmm. All right, Bill, make make um, Michael a co-host, if you don't mind. So go over to his name. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Go over Master. to the three dots. Yeah. Three dots. Here we go. Yeah. Ah, okay. Make, nice. Make co. -host. Make co-host. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Ooh. so you are good to go. Let our speaker start now. Oh, and at the end tonight, we're going to do elections for officers. So if you want to get more involved with the group, we're going to be talking about that stuff. You can vote for people. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to share the entire screen. Why not let you guys into my world? Let's hope that everything else is gone. There we are. Set to full screen here. So, nope. Shift F5. So, kind of used to having multiple screens when I do presentation, and everything is done to have multiple screens during this presentation. So it will be fun to do it with just one screen and see what happens, basically. I did this talk in St. Louis on which day was it? Uh, it's Tuesday today, right? Yeah, it was uh, last Thursday. And I arrived in your beautiful country on Wednesday. So yeah, I was basically yet light out of my proverbial. Uh, so we're, we're recording, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, it was very yet like, uh, basically. So this will be much better, I can guarantee you, because I've been sleeping. I've been doing a lot of sleeping. Um, also, the last guy that arrived, uh, I went around and offered everyone a, a gingerbread uh, snap, oh. uh, because today we're celebrating the uh, Swedish, uh, Swedish tradition of Lucia. That's why. And we have many more. So everyone have a cookie. I will not have any because they tend to go to all the wrong places. I also have no idea how to do things like chats or monitor those kinds of things in here. So if you keep an eye on that, if you have or, you know, questions in chat, that would be awesome. Uh, questions in the room is either do this or just shout uh, at me. I'm Michael Sun. I am a systems integration architect. I come from Sweden. Sweden is in Europe. It's actually located right here in Europe, in, in case you don't know. Uh, some basic facts about the country I come from. We are about 10 million people. The south coast of Sweden is further north than your border to Canada. So we're quite far north in the globe. 
We haven't been at war since 1814. Uh, we lost that one. So we're not very good at making wars. And we're kind of proud of that as well. We are an EU member state. And we tend to uh, come at the top level of, you know, general wellness list, like the happiest people or the richest people in the world and whatever. We're also, of course, known for IKEA, uh, Volvos. I have to watch this one because, hey, okay, friends from work. Uh, we're also known for uh, the Nobel Prize, of course. People long stocking. <laughs> Uh, these wonderful people called Abba, of course, and uh, Swedish meatballs. And of course, we're also known for the Swedish chef. <laughs> <laughs> I love that image, by the way. Fun fact, the Swedish chef was actually voiced by a Swedish guy when they started it back in the 60s, uh, but he's not speaking Swedish. Today is the tradition of Lucia, or Lucia, it's a has to do something with some saint or something. We are not really that religious, but we do like to get up very early in the morning during the darkest part of the year and have coffee together and be sung to by people that usually look like this. We start off this tradition really, really early in life. Uh, even though the uh, little girls are very little, we train them into singing together uh, as a choir uh, and usually singing songs of kind of, you know, um, it's dark at the moment. Let's sing a song about it being very dark and perhaps it will be, become lighter. When these girls get older, they still keep singing and they will also come and come to workplaces and you know sing for you in the morning if you're so if you're so inclined. Uh, it's also a very oh, that's not me. Sorry, I'm just I'm I'm trying to get myself over on my computer oh, as a sure. as a thing so I can be separate from the screen. I apologize. We've done this tradition for a very long time since way before everyone in Sweden were beautiful, obviously. <laughs> um, and we also, of course, let the guys uh, participate in this thing, even though it's mostly you know for the girls and the guys don't or even doesn't always seem to happy to be there, which would be even more obvious if we could get <laughs> that guy. Yes. Is there right, right. something with the, the candle? The candle's there? Like, there's one person and no one else is. I don't know. I, I would just like to point out these hats, which are, these are, this is a staple of all. I used to be one of these guys, and the hats are always like crooked like this because you're tired and it's in the morning and you never get this. So, of course, insert Ku Klux Klan joke here. <laughs> oh. um, and uh, we also then have our traditional uh, foods for this, which is uh, saffron bread. And like I brought from Sweden, of course, then uh, strongly flavored gingerbread cookies. So, Lucia. Uh, it was a saint of some sort, which was art by people because of her faith or something like that. It's not the reason why we celebrate it. So whew, let's go into the more serious stuff then. My name is Michael Sack. I've been working in IT since 2001. I've been working with systems integration since 2003. I have an account, an account Azure, which I've had since 2009. I was an Azure before they even had virtual machines there. I've been working professionally with Azure since 2016, thereabouts. If you would like to provide feedback of this session or you know, ask your own questions or just see what I'm up to, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Michael Sand, uh, or you could visit my, uh, I don't know, say blog. I don't know if it's a still thing uh, at Michael Sand. See? I will provide some links at the end also, pointing to these. I would like to talk very, very shortly about the company I work for, and also the reason actually why I'm here, because I work in Stockholm, in Sweden. But I work for a company called Permobil. Permobil make a lot of very useful stuff for people with varying, varying functional disabilities, or uh, yeah, let's use that word. We, of course, have something called power wheelchairs, 
And we also have manual wheelchairs. We also offer something called power assist devices, which is basically attaching a small motor to an existing um, manual wheelchair so that you can travel further and longer, especially uh, if you might be, you know, getting up in the air age. And also we have all kinds of seating and positioning products. If you can imagine yourself being a bit sore in the behind after day at work, sitting down all the time, imagine how it is if that's your entire life. So of course you need good seating position. We're a global company. We're existing in 45 countries, uh, other statistics, blah, 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 blah. And uh, most of all, we are also uh, represented in a couple of very important places here, which is Belleville and, of course, in Nashville. Uh, so if you uh, were to think that uh, I'm kind of tired with that, what I do and what I do for a job or a living, like me, um, and would like to work for something that makes you feel good, uh, at the end of the day, I would hardly recommend moving over to Promo. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, I've actually perhaps added a couple of, of points to this during the day today because I need to start asking this question. Who here uses API management in production today? So we have one. Good. OK, sure. Then you're at the right place because at the last place, almost everyone were already using API management and very, very stoically listening to me uh, just going over the basics of the product. But this is good, this is awesome. So what is API management? API management is an Azure product which sort of, uh, fits a very particular need. It's a product which is not for everyone, but very soon within your organization, you might find yourself in need of it. And then uh, I highly recommend you start looking at it. That's why we're here today. So if you're working in some kind of organization, you're working in, um, uh, in a company or something for like nonprofit or whatever, and you have a server which exposes some kind of data via an API, which is then gotten by the developer. We have a lot of these, of course. Uh, there's nothing, there's no specific need to have any kind of extra product on top of this because you know it's just one API with just one data. Uh, however, uh, you might also have another API which employees are using to get data from another server, other kind of data from another server. And then you might have uh, mobile apps, which is using a completely different API to get completely different data from a completely different server, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, this can quite quickly get out of hand. You have way too many APIs, you have data diversity, you have no reuse, you have no overview, you have no common security model, you have nothing like that. And things tend to be kind of, people work only by themselves, for themselves, and there's no sense of, can we say, togetherness of a platform or something like that. And that's when you should then start looking at Azure API management which is then, of course, just slot itself right in the middle of everything. So we are still having, to the left, we still have the same kind of users of data. And in the back end, we still have the same kind of servers or systems or, or web services or software as a services or whatever. But in the middle, we place the Azure API management, what's called a gateway. So everything gets funneled through that. Why do we do this? Well, let's look at the fundamentals of this thing first. Here are the different parts of the API management uh, platform. First off, you have the admin portal. The admin portal is the thing you will find if you have uh, access to an Azure subscription and you go in into Azure and find API management and click on it, you will have the admin portal. This is where you do things like manage users. You can even create APIs here. You can run analytics on your APIs to find how these are being used by which user and how much and so on and so forth. Then, the, then there's the other part, which is the gateway. 
The gateway is basically where the data flows, where the APIs are actually living, if you, if you know what I mean. So this is basically can handle authentication, can route your calls, it can do caching, all those wonderful things. And lastly, but certainly not least, is the developer portal. A developer portal uh, is not available, available to you out of the box. You have to enable it. Uh, and the reason is that you might not need a developer portal for all your instances. But it's basically a one-stop shop for all your documentation needs of APIs. So when you develop the APIs, you also kind of document them. You say, this is an employee object. The employee object consists of these different properties. And the, these different properties can have these kinds of values, like strings or integers and so on and so forth. These are automatically then propagated to this developer portal. So the APIs are there for whomever wants to consume your APIs and want to look at them. It's also a very good place to test APIs if you are a developer and just want to look at what kind of data you can get from the employee API, employee, employee API for instance, you can just do that. Uh, by the way, I started no clock whatsoever. So gotcha. yes, we sure. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. okay, good. Start. So when do we use this? Well, of course, if you have too many APIs, like I said in the in the beginning. You have diverse locations. Permobile are located, as you saw, in quite a lot of places. We have a lot of diverse locations, of course. And you can have diverse authentication methods. It's another thing that you can overcome by using a common platform, one common way of authenticating to get to your organization's data. There are too many changes. If you have the diverse thing again, if something changes over here, what effect does that have? It's very hard to, to gauge, you know, we need to stop this server for the entire weekend. What, what effect does that have on other APIs? If you don't have an overview, that's hard to answer. You can do a lot of administration of users and access keys and so on and so forth. If you, in this case, you have one administration portal, so you have one place of creating new users and creating new subscriptions to APIs and so forth. And if you feel you have any kind of lack of overview, now why is an overview so important? Well, there are many reasons, but I feel the most important reason is the ability to, uh, to reuse already existing APIs. If you built an employee API, which exposes employee data, okay, sure, we need to secure that because it's kind of, <laughs> but if we have that for one of our end systems within our, uh, an organization, that same API can be used by any other system that needs employee data. You don't need to rebuild any, everything from the ground up again. The only thing you need to do is say, here, you can have this data as well. You can find it here and here's your subscription key and you're good to go. So we use this to standardize for APIs. Having APIs is very, very good. And having usable APIs are even better. And if you have many APIs within an organization, you now have the ability or at least a chance to make this kind of look and behave the same, which is very important when doing, when, when, uh, doing API development. If you have uniform security, it's also much easier to implement and use. If you have one key that will fit many of the APIs, you just distribute that key to whoever need to access the APIs and that key will work for those specific APIs. You don't usually have APIs where you have a lot of different authentication methods within your same platform. So for instance, a key in one place or a basic authentication is something someplace else. You can analyze your APIs and see how they are being used. At the moment, I have an issue internally in which one of our users is calling our APIs a lot. Half of those calls are being done using a, a, a subscription key, which is, doesn't work anymore. So I found that. And the reason I found it was I got an alarm email from the platform saying, someone's trying to log into your platform and it's failing constantly. So I looked at it and I could immediately find which API it was, who was the person who was trying to call, 
um, from what endpoint, what API, what IP, and so on, which is very useful. And it's also a very good place to promote the APIs and then also promote the reuse. There are, as an integration developer and architect since many years, there we tend to be uh, tend to be not that popular within an organization because we always need to ask a lot of questions on which kind of data do you need and why and how and how often and and so on and so forth. If I could just go, well, just visit this email, this URL, there's the documentation, there's the data. Take a look at it and see if, if, if it fits your needs. That's That makes people happy, actually. So before we move on to the into the demos and everything, I need to go over a couple of key concepts. I would love if you could refill my cup with water, please. Absolutely. Yes. So, on the way over to uh, to the US, I met all kinds of interesting viruses uh, on the plane. And all the viruses said, let's go down to his throat and live there. So that's why I still uh, might sound a bit hoarse. So if you were back at university or in college or in high school or whatever, uh, if you would look at this slide and listen to your lecture, you would know that this would be on the test. And yes, if there were a test afterwards, this would definitely be on the test. So you need to understand a couple of things. So you have APIs. APIs are an endpoint in which you send in a request in order to get back data. Within API management, there is a concept called products. A product consists of one or more APIs. So for instance, you can have a sales product, which has both the sales from the European APIs and also, thank you very much, the American APIs, for instance, just making up something as I go along here. Now you have something called a subscription. A subscription is something that a person or a user has to a product. So you get a subscription, a subscription key, in order to get access to that product, subsequently the data. And like I said, the subscription key, a generated string, which is unique for each subscription. And lastly, but certainly not least, I need also to say there are something called policies. And I will use the word policy constantly. And the reason why I'm very adamant in pointing out to these is our API management policies. If you work with Azure and if you do things like operations and maintenance, you might be familiar with Azure policies in which you can set up rule sets that people cannot create virtual machines over a certain size, for instance. These are not those kind of policies. They're still called policies, but it's the coding language of API management. So soon we'll go on a first demo. I am going to point out a couple of prerequisites here. First off, yes, you need an Azure account in order to do anything related to Azure. I don't know why I had to say that. You guys are smart, some people are not, and I have to always point out the fact that you need an Azure account. If you don't already have an API management instance, you also need to set that up. I'm going to talk later about different versions and SKUs and so on. In order to make this thing happen, you also need an account at a organization called openweathermap.org because we are going to get weather data. It's free, by the way, so it doesn't cost you anything. And also you need a way of calling REST APIs. I am going to use Postman, but you can use things like curl or Vision Studio Code or Vision Studio or, or whatever you fancy in order to do that. And this is very, very likely the version, uh, the thing we're going to uh, be doing. So someone, either of these kinds of clients are going to call our endpoint and requests, request weather data. In order to do that, uh, we are going to, oh, there's my mouse pointer, sorry. We are going to set a provider key, which basically means we are going to authenticate to this open weather map here in the backend. This is so we don't need to uh, have all our callers have their own account, basically. And then we're also going to point to the backend service, so set provider service. 
In the back end, we're, uh, on the way back, we're not going to do anything. I only have these here to point out that when data is returned from the backend system, you can do stuff to the data before sending it back to the client, such as transforming the data or caching the response. So let's take a look at the portal. So this is it. Um, that's the amount of Zoom I will give you. Um, this is the admin portal. And also, please try to ignore all of the other things that I'm not touching. There's a lot of information that you can get just simply lost in. But we're going to scroll down to the APIs here. And I have two APIs. I have something called my weather and water management, and we're going to look at my weather. And we can also see under my weather that we have two versions of the same API. I'm going to take a look at explain versions a bit later. So if we look at under version one here, we can kind of see how the information flows. This is not the uh, most beautiful um, interface ever done. I'm very well aware of that. So we can kind of see how the information will flow. Uh, here's your call coming into a front end. We're going to go to the inbound processing, then to the back end, and then back to the outbound processing. So let's look at what we're doing with the Get Current Weather API. We are uh, exposing an endpoint under slash get current, so root and then slash current. We are accepting, we're wanting a parameter called Q. And we are pointing uh, to the backend service of openweathermap.org. So let's look very quickly at the policy for this. So let's see if I can zoom a bit. There we go. So I hope. Uh, so this is the policy or the code, uh, the XML-like uh, language of, um, of API management. Uh, I think the word is a procedural language, which means it can only read from top to bottom. You can't do a thing where you read somewhere in the middle and you begin from the top again and so on. So if someone done, uh, for example, XSLT uh, or HTML, classic HTML, by the way, is also a procedural language. So what I do here is that I execute uh, this thing here, I set a query parameter, which is called app ID, and I hard code that to this value, which is the authentication uh, key for the backend service. And then I do a thing here, which is called a rewrite URI slash weather, and that's because the uh, openweathermap.org API ends with slash weather, so I had to rewrite it. And then last but certainly not least, I point to the service. So that's not very hard. We are basically redressing another API. Now, there is something very cool that you can do straight from the portal. You can test your API straight from the portal. So up here, we have a tab called test. And I will zoom in again for the benefit of people in the back. Um, and to the right here, we can see that it exposes a query parameter, which is called Q in this case. And I will ask for the weather in Stockholm. I'm feeling a bit homesick, going home tomorrow. So, uh, and scrolling down, we can see the accept uh, request URL that this will produce. So you can see that it says slash weather, version one, current, and Stockholm. And then we have the entire request here. If I click send, we got back a response. And the response basically says that it's kind of cloudy and overcast at the moment. And the temperature at home is 263.47 degrees Kelvin. <laughs> so we're not, we're not the surface of the sun at the moment. <laughs> so we can do. We can dress up APIs quite easily. We can expose them to, to other person, other people within our organization. There is no real need for your other, for your user of your API 
to know that we're actually calling another software as a service thing in the back end, right? Of course, for documentation reasons, we do that. But you can basically say, hey, we have a weather service. But it doesn't look very good. So I would like to redress that uh, a little in order to make it look the way I would uh, present it more of a, let's call it a production ready thing. So for that, we expose version two. And version two looks exactly the same. We just have one operation. It's a get operation that says get current weather. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go into the design mode again. But instead of having a query parameter, we're pulling the location directly from the uh, from the URL or from the address. So if you have your URL and then we'll go slash Nashville, you will get like the Nashville data instead. Looking at the inbound processing, I'm doing a couple of things now. Let's go expand that thing. This one you already recognize. I add a query parameter for the backend, which contains an application ID. However, the value looks kind of different this time. It's not hard coded. And this is because I am referencing what's called the named value collection. The named value collection is global to your API management instance. And it's basically just key value, key value, key value that all your APIs can access. So you can kind of easily find things, you know, like store these things, because if this API key was used in other APIs, you would then just update that in one single place should the API key need to be updated. If not, you will then go through all the APIs. Um, if someone sends me a parameter called units, I will skip this action, but if they don't, I will create a parameter and set that to metric. So metric is the default. And then I will create a query parameter called Q, if you remember that from the original thing, but I will pull that information instead from this whole thing, which is the context, the context of the call. And then we look at the request and then we look for what's called the matched parameter. So we're looking for location. And then we set the backend service. Now, in order to go, instead of just go testing that thing again, I'm going to do that from Postman. And I'm going to do it by zooming in again. So view, zoom in, zoom in. Again, nope. Ah, one, one more, I think. Let's see, there we go. Oop. Hey, foreshadowing. So there we go. We have weather version two. So if we look at the call here, there we go. We can see that I'm calling my endpoint, my uh, sorry, my API management instance, weather slash v2, because we made the other one, and I'm asking from Stockholm. So it looks a lot better. So I'm going to send that over here, and now we get back that the weather, the temperature is minus 9.51 degrees, which to me means that it's nine degrees below the freezing point of water. If we send in a parameter called imperial, we will get the current weather there in the temperature, which you might understand. So it's kind of cold at home right now. <laughs> Not very, but you know, cold enough. Um, very quickly about versions before I go back to the slide deck and explain them further. If you look very closely up here, you see that it says weather V2. If I were to go in here, you can say that it says weather V1. That's the way we do when we point the different uh, calls to different versions. We have different endpoints for different versions, basically. And there are very good reasons for that, which I will try to show you now. Uh, there we go, I think. And then we go back here. Yes, let's go into the versioning stuff. Woo. You might have an API in version one. An API access data in the backend system. The system is called Sys Service One. In this case, nothing fancy, nothing special, but service 
One is not very good. It's not working very well. It's running on a Windows Server 2008. It's almost 32 bits. Uh, we need to upgrade it. We need to do something new. But as you all know, if you want to upgrade a system, you need to run it in parallel for a while because we need to trust the new system. So therefore, we need to have another version that only exclusively access service two. So your caller will automatically know, or you know, will know if you call version one, you will get data from the old system, and if you call version two, so you can do a good thing of running things in parallel, which is I think very powerful. And then whenever someone decides to shut down version service one, you could then just delete version one and you only have version two left. Other reasons to have versions is when your data is, let's call it incompatible between different versions. So let's say for instance, that you have, again, an employee API, your version one might, if you want to do a create an employee, create a user, the data needed to create that user might look in a very might look in a particular way. But then for some reason, you need to update that information a lot. So you need to have another way of creating the user. Then you need to have another version. So, so you can have still the parallel uh, the parallel things. You can create it the old way because that's the way some of your users are creating. Uh, creating employees, and then you have the new full-fledged thing, for instance. So let's kick out some more demos. This demo is a bit confined, I agree. Uh, however, it's also a very good demo to show what you can do with APIs other API manage management than just simply redressing existing APIs on the backend services. So we are going to do basic routing here. Um, the scenario is the following. You work in a company. That company has two major ERPs. Uh, one is located in Europe and one is located in America. And what you would like to do is instead of having different versions or different endpoints for ordering stuff, you would like to just present one single point, say, give me order things. And we would like to then send that order request to either the American ERP or the European ERP, depending on something. And in this case, we're going to depend it on whether the user, the subscriber is calling using the American product or the European product, the API management. So let's take a look at how this is done. So within, our APIs, let's see, collapse perhaps, yes. So I'm going to do this. Sorry for the flashing image on, uh, on the Zoom call. So we have order management here. Order management has a version one, which contains one operation called submit order. So to the left here, we also have something called products. And that is, of course, where you define your product. And we can see that we have two products. One is called ERP America, and one is called ERP Europe. The ERP America contains one uh, contains these APIs, order management version one and version two. And ERP Europe contains the exact same APIs. The thing that's going to differentiate the calls is whether the user authenticates and says, I am a European user. I'm using the European product. That's how we're going to do the, uh, the, um, uh, the route. I will zoom in quite quick, quite soonish. So looking at the API, we have something called submit order. And within the inbound processing, this is the uh, code for doing that. Now, we're not going to call proper ERP systems. I have not opened any backend backdoors into Permobile's ERPs. I have simply created two very lightweight services called Logic Apps. One is representing the European ERP and will just generate a, uh, an order number and 
prefix that order number with EU. And the American one will do the exact same thing, just AM. In order to call that, I need to have this thing up here. That's when you call Lodicaps. But let's just please ignore that for now because it's just very finicky. So we are using a what's called a shoes when statement. This is very similar to if else else if statements, basically. So we are saying basically everything within these is shoes, and we reach the first one saying, "Are you from Europe?" So we're once again looking in the context of the call. Within the context of the call, there is a property called products, and we are looking at the product name. And if the product name is ERP Europe, then we know that the caller is using a European subscription, and we will point that caller to the European ID, European ERP back. Same for America. And if by some strange reason they are able to access this either from not Europe or America, they will get a some kind of general error saying, I don't know which product you are using, so you can't submit any orders. Looking how we call this. We have the order management thing here. And I'm going to open the thing from America. Now, when we submit or call this, so I'm just thinking, by the way, I think this will be much better for everyone. Boom. It's kind of more readable for everyone in here, I suddenly realized. So let's do this instead. So we're going to host information into this endpoint, which is order Ivan submit. And we are going to send in very simple body. We're going to order some seriously cool things because everyone wants seriously cool things. So we want to order those. In order to authenticate, we need to submit that API key, which was generated, which has been generated for us earlier. And we are sending that key in a header. And this header, the standard name for that header is OCP APIM subscription key. And within uh, Postman, you can do things with variables. So this is, of course, a variable which contains that key. So we know that this is the American key. So if someone calls, we authenticate using this key. So let's do that. This might take a couple of seconds, the first one. Yep. And we got back order number with AM and some kind of generated thing. So therefore, we knew that it was correctly routed to the American ERP system. So if you do the same thing for Europe, we can see that the, um, the URL here is exactly the same. If I just quickly go back and forth between these, you can see that we're, we're aiming for the exact same place. We're actually also sending the exact same data in this case, still series of cool things, but we are using another key to authenticate yourself. This key points to the European product. And we get back a order number that says EU, basically. So, we are now a bit of a crossroad when it comes to time, because I actually prepared a side thing on security. If people were so inclined or a bit not more knowledgeable about API management to start off. So I don't know how, how long have I been so talking for? You, you're golden. You've got about, um, well, traditional end for us would be in about 15 minutes. Yep. So, but generally based on how the audience feels, you've got a couple minutes past that if you've got some things. So sure. I think this is, I mean, I, I can go on a bit for this. This is amazing. Okay, yeah, good, right? good. Agreed. Yeah, right. On, on that you feel it. So, I'm going to talk about those things I want, I needed to talk about first, and then so I did a little bit extra about different um, security options when calling APIs. Or security mm -hmm. options. So different flavors and costs. When you come back to whatever you were working on and working at and want to check this out, 
you want to create a new instance and you might want to know which instance you are going to create and why. So the cost for the instances are on the next slide. This is just a rundown of, of features of feature comparisons. So to the left, you have the consumption layer. It's for a super lightweight usage. You pay per, it says million calls, but I think you pay per 10,000 calls. This has one very uh, obvious drawback. It has no developer portal. So if you do that, you can't do all the cool documentation thing I was talking about earlier. However, compared to the other ones, you pay per call, you don't pay per minute of use or hour of use. So this means that if you set something up and then leave it for six months, it's not going to cost anything because as long as no one's calling it, it doesn't cost anything. Then you have the developer SKU, and this is for anything that is not in production, basically. You can, uh, you can send 500 requests per second, and it has all the features of the premium all the bells and whistles one to the right, but at a fraction of the cost. However, you're not, of course, not allowed to run it in production. And also, you get no SLA which means uh, even if Microsoft actually messed up and they had done that for me, um, our developer portals, uh, developer, one of our developer instances simply stopped responding because they were doing some kind of updates and that update failed. But since they don't monitor those things because there's no, no SLA, they didn't get an alarm even from their internal processes. So uh, you might consider if you do a lot of testing or have an important testing thing, perhaps instead using the basic for, for those things. And then you go up to standard, which is, of course, then you know a lot more requests per second, and then you get the premium one. Premium one has one very, very important feature. It supports all kinds of network connections. The other ones, except for the developer, of course, you can't connect that to a network, a national network. There are things kind of coming on using things like private endpoints for it instead. So there could be some network connectivity coming to standard and basic down the line. I don't really know exactly where they are on that because of MDAs and stuff, if you know what I mean. Uh, so you still need the premium if you want to have, you know, the full-fledged, like I want to have everything behind networks and firewalls because I still live in the early 2000s. Here's the cost. First million is free for consumption, then 0.35% for 10,000 calls. Developer, $48 a month, all the way up to premium, which costs a premium, $2,795 per month. And that's not even the end of it, actually, because if you want to do the really cool stuff, like let's say, for instance, if we in Permobil wanted to say that we would like to have one global platform, we could say we'll have like one instance in Australia, one instance in Europe, and one instance in America. And then they will simply handle all the routing for us because we can then basically say api.permobil.com and Microsoft will just point that to whatever closest, which is cool. However, then we'll have three premium instances in order to make that thing work. It's kind of a tough sell at the moment internally, I would say, uh, but I mean, maybe sometime down the line. So let's look at security then. I feel like I'm going to rush this a bit, but take time. Sure. Um, first off, you have the subscription key. This is the, the most common way of authenticating to any API out there. The most lightweight, someone says, basically, here's your key, so send in a header, which is called whatever, you know, API key, and then send this key in that header or you can send it as part of the query string if you want to. Since everything is usually HTTPS, all the headers and the query string is called part of the TLS package, which basically means that if someone were to intercept that thing, you would still, you know, the, the key would still be uh, not there. It would still be secret. However, it is a shared secret. So this means that if I give you a key, you can give that exact same key to them. 
and I have no idea knowing which one of you is using or is calling me. It's, it's, it might be either of you. You're, it's the same key, basically. And it's also in clear text, so therefore, you know, it's it's very it's very easy to have things like find people who check in API keys in in repositories, especially developers of a younger generation tend to do that. Uh, but it's very portable. It's very easy to just you recycle and get another key, send that in, you know, whatever in Teams or something like that for the test environment, update that, and it works perfectly. One way of mitigating some of the inherent uh, security issues with subscription keys is, of course, a regular recycling of keys. So let's say once every two months, three months or something, you just remove all the keys and everyone has to start using the new keys, basically. Which, when I start to do that within my organization, they will probably shoot me. <laughs> I think. And then we have another version, uh, another thing, which is a what's called a de facto standard for APIs, which is using OAuth. And I'm not going to go super deep into OAuth today, but I'm going to show you how it works, at least. This uses tokens instead, and it's a federated security thing. Exactly what that is, I'm going to show you quite uh, soonish. And instead of using uh, simply a string of, of a string of numbers, uh, you can do other things with it, such as using things like claims, audiences, or roles. So not only do you log into a system within that uh, token, we can also see which kind of access right you have within that system if you do the whole shebang, um, champagne for everyone version of how you can implement OAuth. So here's how OAuth works. And this is not inherent to API management or anything like that. This is a standard which is outside of Microsoft. It's a, like I said, it's a de facto standard. There are different ways of implementing it, kind of flavors, depending on whether you're a Unix or Linux or whatever guy. And you can use this from any kind of code base to call APIs. In this particular case, we're going to use uh, Postman, and that is the authenticated client. And we want to access uh, an API. In this case, we will actually be using a secured or a hardened version of the order processing API again. So we're going to call that, and behind that, we have the backend services, which are being protected by the API. So the first thing you have to have in order to do this is a provider an OAuth provider. Azure Active Directory is a very useful uh, OAuth provider. It has actually some drawbacks in its functionalities. Uh, so if someone says that there is better, that might be the thing. However, I usually have access to this, so that's why I use it. So the authenticating client asks the provider for a token. So it basically, it essentially logs in to the provider and the provider responds back with a token. It's a long, long string of text instead and say, here you go. According to me, this is you. And the authenticating client sends that as a header to the API. API manager then takes a look at this thing and says, this means nothing to me. I had to verify that with the provider. And this is the essentially the, the core of what federated security is. Another very good example of federated security is the system that we have of passports. So I have a Swedish passport. If I were to instead go home, go down to Mexico, I could show that passport to the Mexican Border Patrol saying, this is a Swedish passport. And they could look at it and go like, yeah, and it kind of looks like a Swedish passport. We trust this paper that you are Michael. And according to us, you can enter our, our wonderful country. If I were to show up with a piece of paper that I've written in crayon and say, I'm Michael, I'm from Sweden, and show that to them, they will probably say, we don't trust this paper. That's exactly what federated security is. And then this works exactly the same. So into 
someone shows the passport to our API management instance and says, please believe me. And we say, well, we have to double check. So we ask the provider, excuse me, is this yours? And the provider will probably then respond back, say, yes, this is mine. I fully agree with what's ever in there. And we can then go, okay, good. Then we trust you to access the backend services. So compared to the, uh, the, the token, sorry, the, um, the key, then we just have the client calling API management. API management was would look in its own repository if the, the key was there and then let everyone through. Another very good part of this is that you, if you protect the backend services with this, they don't need to bother themselves at all with any kind of authentication. As long as they can trust that the call is coming from this guy, they can just let anything through. So you have you can spend zero time on developing that. And in this case, user, user management, access management, those kinds of things is very minimal here. Um, and token refreshment and things like that is handled by the provider instead. But sorry, if we need to use this in a call, we still would need to send the um, subscription key. So you can see that it's, it's second from the top, it's still the subscription key. And I mean, the reason is because it's, it's there. It's super easy just to generate. Why not just keep it? It's also a way for API management to identify who are you. Once again, like which product is this and so forth. That's still connected to the subscription key. But then we have what's called the authorization bearer token, which is this humongous thing here. And this is a very shortened version of it, actually. And then we have all the other things, and then we have the actual data that we send. So let's look at this from a demo standpoint. And we will begin by looking at the implementation of it in API management. So we have our submit order. It looks exactly the same, receives the exact same data. However, now it looks a little different. And also, once again, remember that this is procedural. So if this step doesn't execute, this step, this thing will not execute anyway. So we have a policy called validate shot or JWT. And we will then look in a header court authorization. We will say if you fail, we use them back at 401. We will say token is invalid. And there are some other settings over here, which might not be that interesting. There's something called an open config URL. This is the URL which the API management will send the token to. Like I said, we have to verify that this token is actually valid. And then we also look at what's called the audience that's setting within the token and also the issuer of the setting within the token. This means, or do you want to talk to me? And was this token issued by this issuer. And this issuer is the Permobile API, basically. So if we were to call this API, we have order as American secure. I'm going to close this down for a bit. And if I, sorry, let's look at the headers. We still have the key here, still have a body. If I send it, it will respond back with token is invalid because we haven't really submitted a token. How do we get a token? I hear you ask. Well, the first thing you need to uh, implement that yourself as a caller. So I have a, a separate call here called get auth token. Sorry. Obviously I was testing this very hard <laughs> before I left work. So. If we look up here, we can see that this is a totally different endpoint compared to my APIs. So we're calling the provider in order to get back this token information. And we're basically saying, I, was, I want to talk to this resource. I want to identify myself as this client ID, which is a client registered in our, it's an identity within our Azure Active Directory. And I'm going to use this secret. I'm not even going to do a mouse over because it's being recorded. <laughs> so but I'm going to do that using the secret. 
And I am also saying that this is a, what's called a grant type client credentials, which basically means someone sending me username and password, because this is essentially what it is, it's username and password. So if I send this off, I will get back a whole heap of information. I will say this, say that it will expire in 35.99, which is uh, almost an hour. And we also have something called the access token here. So let's very quickly look at the access token. So that looks like it was a bit harder than I would hope. So I have to reset the Zoom to start. And I'm gonna go like that. And then I'm going to open this one and go to a place called jwt.ms. So this is a place where you can read the content of a uh, of a JWT token. So if I paste the JWT token in here, I get all kinds of useful information. Now, everyone was like, I thought this was encrypted. Yes, I thought that was encrypted initially before, also before I found this page and realized that no, it's not encrypted. So if you come across the JWT token, you can actually use that token for an hour if you want to, because it expires within an hour. So that's why you can only use it in an hour. And looking at the different parts here, we can also see the green part at the bottom. Now, the green part is the signature. And the signature is based off a private key, a private certificate, which is owned by our provider. This means that only the provider can update the token. So if I were to, you know, try to finagle something here and say, well, I'm going to uh, update the audience or I want to, um, I want to, um, to update the expiration for this so it's it's available for for whatever then i will change the token but i will also then have an incompatible signature because the signature is based off of the token and the private and um, uh, the private key so therefore it's it's least it's immutable it's not secret but it's immutable and I do like that it's not secret because then you can actually view the, the thing when you're starting to do OAuth, you tend to, well, you can look at me, you tend to lose a lot of hair uh, because you tend to pull it out because you get all kinds of different strange security exceptions all the time. But if you can at least look at it, you can see that, oh, I'm using the wrong audience, for instance. So we can do that. Now, if we want to use this in a call, we need to have this sent using uh, in this API, uh, sorry, in Postman. So in Postman, we have something called authorization. And in authorization, you can select what's called a bearer token. And that is exactly what we're using. So we're sending this in as a, as a variable, which is the bearer token. The variable was set by a little fancy script that I just smuggle in there. So instead of having to copy paste that between windows, whenever I authenticate, I just assign that to this variable. So if I now use this thing again, after having authenticated, I can click send and I will get back an order number instead. So it was sent through, which is, so now it's super secure, basically, for at least an hour. Um, and I would very much recommend that you take this kind of thing to, to heart if you start looking at APIs as a thing within a traditional enterprise thing. So if you're looking at APIs from a standpoint, I need, I have data that I want to sell. I want to start monetizing this data. Of course, you want to ask people for OAuth and this kind of strange thing. That is just a key. Here you go. Start using the thing. I need the money. But if, for instance, within our organization, we have an employee API, I have protected the employee API with OAuth, of course, because I don't want that key, which is very portable, to just fall into the wrong hand and everyone can just start using it. They can try, but they still need to or then also have a client ID and a client password in order to get the thing together. 
So to reiterate really quickly, for almost all other uh, scenarios, you can use the key, uh, the API key. But if you read it, if you want to protect the data in some way, you, I, you can use OAuth on top of it. All this is, of course, very well documented, and you can find it on my homepage and all those kind of things. You know what I mean? So we are actually coming up towards the end of this thing. So a quick recap of things I want you to take with you when you come, come from here. API management is a focal point, a very good place to collect all your APIs, redress your APIs, and keep track of your APIs used within your organization. It is simple. It is actually quite simple to do. Most scenarios are covered by out-of-the-box policies, policies which are very well documented, and you can just pull that from documentation, paste that into whatever it is you're doing, and then start to you know, update some of the settings like variable names. It's also seriously cool, I feel. You can do things like 3,000 calls per second, requests per second, including tracing all those calls and all kinds of analytics, which I alluded to earlier, where a user um, within our organization is misusing our APIs. So you get that totally out of the box, which is something that you usually don't get if you just have like one API built on a cool JavaScript implementation with a couple of libraries and then hosting there. So if you want to get stuck in, start working and looking at these things in a more in-depth, I highly suggest you visit the MS Learn page to just go to Introduction to API Management. They do a much better job of letting you ease into this product than I just did. You can find it under AKAMS slash APIM underscore one, or just go to MS Learn and search blah, blah, blah. Or, or you can start looking at the official documentation, which is now also called Learn because Microsoft. Uh, so the documentation of it is also a very good place to start looking. Oh, sorry, do you want me to? Got it. You were done? Okay, good. Uh, if you like what you saw here and want to get more stuck in with different, uh, trying to recreate what I did, you can find this thing on my GitHub page. It's under github.com slash Michael Sand. And you can find it under the repo called Reactor STLM API dash pub for public. I've also put in a couple of labs in there to start doing a bit more uh, advanced API management stuff. And by then, I'm actually done. So thank you very much for for staying awake and uh, and alerts. So do we have any 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 questions from somewhere? Oh, we have hands in the air, but let's start with you because I saw it. So the API manager, is that more of like an import? Like you have to actually know your APIs are at or will it do discovery or how do you actually get your APIs into the, or is it just you turn it on and then the the, the skew on and then it collects all your APIs? No, you so you have to, of course, do. So remember when I showed you that we, we did the thing where I pointed to a backend service uh, within uh, API manager is when we did, the first API. So mm -hmm. um, for my weather here, let's look at the version two, get current weather. We are as we are pointing to that backend service. Yeah, okay. And in this case, we do this thing here. So imagine that. So I mean, this is just a software as a service thing. It's right out there. It's easily, uh, easily accessible, but you can also do other things. So for instance, if you have things like code running in the open Azure function, that might be exposed as an HTTP thing. It might already be used today directly, but you can just as easily say, well, now we'll start using it from API management instead because then we can collect everything and in one common place and then just have API management instead set setback and service base URL and point to that Azure function or other kind of service. This is kind of what I'm trying to do a lot within our company is trying to find, you know, things to reuse basically and mm -hmm. don't don't make people just build small islands for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, please say there. Maybe maybe one thing to add to the to the answer is that while it does not provide a discovery service, if you have a swagger definition mm -hmm. of your API, it can yeah. import it. Okay. So you don't have to sit there and import to hundreds of yes, yeah, absolutely yeah, one hundred percent correct. Yeah. Yes. So if you were to start off with something like swagger or 
which is also called open API. There's actually, you can create API just from definitions, either to, if you're really old like me and you you have SOAP APIs, you can actually, actually supply a WSDL and say, can you please make this thing into something more modern? And the same thing is with the open API. You can even do it directly from an actual resource. So if, for instance, you already, like I said, you have a function app, you can point to that function app, it will look through the function app for the different, um, whatever kind of different methods or whatever functions it is, it finds that is available to it, and it will do that for you. So very, very good point. Uh, I totally forgot about that. And that'll load your documentation too, but from the portal you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes, my is there a logging piece of this, like that logs all the incoming requests, yes. outgoing requests, and all that? Yes, that there is. Thing? Yes, there is. So if I'm not sure it's available to us in the consumption level, and I'm not going to show you <laughs> things. Once again, we're being recorded. Uh, so uh, no analytics is not available to us here. So it's like going to give you a launch for free. <laughs> You're going to charge it more. Yeah, yeah so yeah. if you have that by the minute, it's a it kind of, yeah, it, it has this technical reason. If we are if we turn off the recording, I can show you stuff which is available uh, in, in the, the permaville test endeavor.